Welcome everyone to the ICLE Africa webinar titled Advancing Education with Educational Partnership for Innovation in Communities Africa. It was Henry Ford who said, coming together is the beginning, staying together is a progress, and working together is success. This quote is particularly relevant for today's webinar, where here we have all come together to listen, to learn, and to be inspired. But how do we continue to work together, to build those partnerships at last, to effectively collaborate, to improve civic action, and to grow local capacity and deepen transformative research? Some of these questions will be answered today in this webinar as we deep dive into the EPIC model. This model drives systems changing by linking cities and universities for collaborative problem solving. ICLE has been very proud to support the, ICLE, the EPIC network over the past few years. We have helped with numerous introductions to relevant city officials and researchers and supported these officials participate in a number of EPIC engagements. ICLE Africa has also supported the EPIC A initiation workshop in Africa and as an organization that has done extensive research and development work, ICLE Africa has significantly contributed to bridging the policy and science divide. EPIC and ICLE Africa are also excited to co-host a session at ICLE's Daring Cities Congress in a few weeks time. And so it is with great pleasure that ICLE now hands over to Dr. Mzimu Marisa, who will be moderating this webinar on behalf of EPIC. Thank you so much, Jess, for that introduction to our webinar. And welcome everyone, as Jess has already welcomed us. My name is Mzime Debele Murisa, and I work as a program officer for an organization called Start International. Together with ECLE and other organizations which are represented in this webinar, Start is part of the EPIC Africa Network and they have formed this network and also have an outreach into Asia. Today we are privileged to have a number of uh, pilot cities which have successfully implemented the EPIC Africa Network and we are going to hear from them a little later on. But the idea today is to share lessons given that context plays a very huge role when it comes to implementing this model. And also to share these lessons in order to give us um, uh, the lessons and the successes, the failures uh, that come with, with the EPIC model. The beauty of the model lies in its flexibility to adopt local conditions and therefore it can take several forms and in a little while i'm going to introduce our speakers starting off with dr anthony sochi who is the senior lead for the international resilience and adaptation policy at the u.s environmental protection agency office of the international and tribal affairs tony is going to take us through um, how the EPIC model and the EPIC Africa network was developed and how far we have gone. Another one of our esteemed speakers today is Dr. Sean Odenehu, and he is a senior manager at the Climate Protection Unit of the Etiquini Municipality, which is in Durban, uh, South Africa. Again, uh, Sean is going to give us an overview of their work in their city. Next, we have uh, Ms. Edna Odiambo, and she is the country lead of the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, CDKN, in Nairobi, Kenya. Edna is also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. And again, she will share experiences of EPIC in, in her city. Last but not least, uh, among our panelists is Dr. Gilbert Siame who is the director of the Center for Urban Research and Planning at the University of Lusaka, Zambia. Again, as part of the pioneers of EPIC in their cities, they're going to share their experiences. And at this point, I will turn over or give the floor to Dr. Anthony Sochi, 
he's going to give us an overview of, of EPIC and some of the initiatives and how the network has been going uh, across Africa. So over to you, Tony, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mzime. So I'm just waiting for the slides to populate. Ah, there we go. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. It's morning here. But just by way of background for a few minutes before the, the real show begins today, I wanted to lay out the background, the backdrop for the EPIC model and tell you a little bit about what it is and where it came from and what its attributes are in my view. So it's really a simple model in its basic form that brings local governments and communities together with local universities to basically help local governments and com communities build resilience to address issues like, uh, well, to build capacity to address issues like resilience, sustainability, and adaptation. Um, it brings the untapped resources that are concentrated in universities, typically the knowledge that's there, the skills, the students, and the innovation that's there to the service of local governments. And together in these partnerships, they work on projects on behalf of the city and the community. Students get a lot of applied learning, which they would not normally get as part of their courses. And as Mzime said, it's a very adaptable model, socially, normatively, culturally, and contextually. So it's it's adjustable. Next slide, please. So very quickly, um, the EPIC model was born out of the University of, uh, of Oregon. And um, it was the brainchild of two faculty members, two professors there who wanted to find a way to enrich the student experience and enrich it by give them, giving them practical um, by involving them in practical projects, the real projects that local communities and local governments were struggling with, but typically don't have the capacity to deal with either resource-wise or the number of people working. So um, back in 2009, the model, these two professors try the model locally. It's very popular, it begins to catch on. And by 2014, they formed the EPIC network of universities, mostly in the US who have joined and started implementing this model. So it wasn't until 2017 that I and a number of other partners got together and decided to bring the model internationally for the first time on a grand scale. And so in 2017, we were successful in bringing people from around the world to our training on the model in Germany. And later that year, we also did a regional training on that model in, in uh, Cape Town, South Africa for Sub-Saharan Africa cities and university representatives. Uh, basically today, there is an EPIC Africa network, the first network outside of the US, and we're beginning to make inroads into Asia. Next slide. So I want to end on this slide, or basically the next two slides, and try to make the point that this model, however simple it is in its makeup, which is part of its attraction, is also very innovative and very transformational in the following ways. It taps into intellectual resources and technical capacity that's sitting there in universities. And it lends that skill to the needs of local governments and communities through this partnerships. It's not meant to be a series of one-offs, but a long-term relationship. Um, it gives students experience in real issues. They're not made up. And most students really thirst for these kinds of experience that have become built into their classrooms. And the universities, there's been lots of justifiable 
complaints that universities seem detached from their communities. This is a way through this model that universities become better integrated into the communities where they reside and are more sensitive to the issues facing those communities. So it's a real, it's a real new paradigm within universities and within the local community as well. Um, many students often become attracted to local government service and go on to work with local governments and change their, alter their career plans. In addition, the EPIC projects that universities and local governments do together, they incorporate many of the UN sustainable development goals, especially sustainable cities and communities and effective partnerships. And it drives inclusivity, which is a key, uh, a key point behind the SDGs. Um, so the beauty of the model is that the adopters are self-organized and self-led, often into forming into regional networks, such as Epic Africa. Next slide, please. And it's scalable. The last point I want to make is that the, the networks are scalable. Here's a depiction, it's basically idealized, of what a scaled up F Epic Africa network might look like. Next slide, please. And here's what a scaled up EPIC network globally or internationally might look like going on the road. And with that, I'd like to end and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Tony, for that overview and the journey through which um, uh, EPIC has traveled, or more so how the the model works. And I'd just like to reiterate a few points from, from Tony's um, presentation. That since 2017, the EPIC Africa network has been growing. Of course, today we will hear from uh, our colleagues from three cities that really are the pioneers of implementing the model in Africa. But essentially, um, the area which EPIC seeks to address is, the, is this fundamental transformation or improvement of the relationship between local governments, local councils, local municipalities, the communities, and these communities can be in different uh, forms as we will hear from the cities later on, and local universities. And this is normally through the use of innovative uh, ways. Um, next slide, please. And you find that EPIC becomes very relevant uh, as, as a collaborative partnership, mainly because, as we know, cities face very complex and often multiple stressors. And these are also compounded by wicked challenges such as climate change. So it, it, it's a multi-stressor uh, context, and then you also have all these multiple stressors that come through. And within our continent of Africa, because of the rapid population uh, 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 growth, these, these challenges are made worse, um, among other factors. And our cities in general uh, need to address these multi-dimensional challenges in order to build resilience, particularly in the face of uh, climate change. So what it means is that simple, one-dimensional as well as siloed approaches to try and address such complex challenges and wicked prob problems is really unfruitful. Therefore, there is a need to, to have innovative collaborative partnerships uh, to increase civil action, but also to be able to address these multifaceted uh, challenges. So what EPIC does is it, it provides the opportunity to use innovation to, to, to build collaborative partnership and also to improve uh, civic action. And the EPIC model as mentioned before by Tony and myself is that it's bringing together uh, the, the, the three partners, essentially uh, local authorities, 
universities. And the beauty of it is that, as Tony mentioned in being inclusive, it also includes uh, uh, students and communities and the use of innovative uh, solutions. So at this point, we really want to hear from the city and I've introduced the speakers uh, from Durban, from Nairobi and from Lusaka. And I will ask our panelists some questions just to be able to, uh, to hear more about how they went about their EPIC, um, uh, the implementation of the EPIC model in their city. And I'll ask that for each speaker, maybe a minute or two, I'll give you a minute or two, just to, to give us a, a short summary of your EPIC uh, project so that um, we all hear and understand what you are doing first before we dive into the, the, the questions. So starting off um, with Sean, um, my first question to you, Sean, is what is the EPIC Africa Network? and what are you currently doing but before you answer this sean please just give us a, a, an, an overview of the work that you are doing in Durban. thanks for making the time to join us today and to listen to our story here so in Durban, we have we ran a pilot following the December 2017 training. We ran a pilot program over the 2018-2019 academic years, and we were working with an informal settlement at the bottom of a catchment to understand the challenges that they were experiencing. Uh, halfway through that program, uh, we had some major floods in April 2019 in Durban, and we changed focus of the program to develop an informal disaster response plan that can be used through informal settlements in Durban, and that's now with our disaster management unit. So that shows the real value of it. We, we can really tackle the problems where they're most needed, and we, it has the flexibility to be able to shift to uh, uh, different challenges as as they arise. Um, so that, that's what we've been doing. We're currently, we, we're planning our scaled up program for transformative river management using communities to manage our rivers as part of another program in Durban. Um, so what is the Epic Africa Network? Well, um, having been having worked with uh, Dr. Sochi for many years with the Durban Adaptation Charter, we were very open to his approach when he, when he told us about this great model that's been working so well in the States for 10 years and we should try it. Uh, and then we uh, were able, we we're happy enough to attend this training in Cape Town and also the ICLI training in Bonn, uh, that was uh, part of the Resilient Cities Congress. And we had uh, 10 sets of uh, trainees there, a pairs of uh, a senior academic and a senior city official together from one city uh, would attend training with nine other pairs. And coming out of that December training, we had uh, Dr. Siami, uh, Ed, uh, Mr. Odiambo, and myself leading the charge as the three co-leaders of the newly established Epic Africa Network. Um, and we, we've all run our programs and we'll hear about them today. Um, having made that uh, progress uh, and with the support of the EPIC N Secretariat, the Global Secretariat, uh, Marshall Curry is a fantastic person. If you're interested in this, get hold of him. We can provide all the contact details, obviously. Uh, and he's really helped us uh, form a, a network uh, instead of just three uh, or and originally three just sort of separate entities to meet monthly on a Monday evening uh, and help each other set up our networks. Uh, and that led to the training in uh, Cape Town uh, when we had another a bunch of uh, trainees, oh, sorry, in, in Durban in February this year. Um, and once again, we had uh, 10 or so pairs of training and that actually stimulated quite good growth in the network. So we have another three or four, I think that's actually five that are now planning, properly planning. We did have, uh, the COVID uh, lockdown situation happening, which has been very unfortunate because the training was in February and lockdown was in March. But despite that, uh, we've had real progress. So we've had the city of, uh, or county government of Mombasa, who actually used the COVID pandemic to uh, develop these um, uh, sanitation tunnels for their ferry and the market to get sort of 500,000 people a day walking through these tunnels to 
to, uh, as part of their first output for the their, their new EPIC program. So they've, they've started a program. The second uh, output they're doing is one around transformative river management. So they've worked with us as part of our Durban Adaptation Charter and they've taken on those learnings. So you can see how we're having this transmission of learning between African cities uh, and it's very effective. Uh, the model itself is so effective because you know the students get real life experience they can put that in their cv and the cities are getting this great knowledge that that comes right from bottom up and it's really cost effective as well i, I think gilbert will give us a good example of how cost effective but probably for me the, the biggest win of this is that it draws on our youth in africa and, and the innovation that's existing within there and we're not talking about designing sort of nuclear rockets here we, we're talking about sort of genuine problems, a lot of it's planning based, a lot of it's talking to people, doing surveys or GIS or something like that. But collectively, all these, when you've got a, a whole bunch of modules being taught and students producing this research, uh, it, it, it adds up to a real good body of knowledge that the city can implement. And it's all targeted at communities where it's most needed. Like I said, for our pilot was in vulnerable informal settlement communities and it, and, and it is helping them address uh, or deal with these mega floods that we, we've been getting from time to time. But it can be anything, it can be any, any topic. There you go, uh, Nzine. Thank you so much, Sean, for that overview of uh, the Epic Africa Network as well as the work that you are doing in Durban. Just a disclaimer to say that Sean used to be part of the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal, although now he works with the city and through EPIC, um, they have been partnering with the university. So Sean, there have been growing concerns that universities often are too detached from the day-to-day -day issues which uh, communities uh, face uh, and where they reside. Does the adoption of the EPIC model represent perhaps a, an important cultural uh, shift within universities to become more sensitive, as well as uh, responses to the practical needs of communities where they reside. If you feel that this is so, um, please explain to us why it's important or needed. Um, well, South Africa has a very rich history in its uh, universities of activism, you know, and that comes all the way from apartheid days in the 80s. I remember seeing our own university, UKZN, which I'm an honor research associate, uh, literally being riots running through there uh, against apartheid. And that has always been the case. Uh, maybe in the last sort of 10 years, the, the unrest in universities has centered around the, the cost of tuition and the ability of students to support themselves. Um, I think where the, the problem has tended, to, where there's been a gap, has been where research uh, or where uh, modules are taught, the projects that are set for modules are often very theoretical. They're not based on any sort of anything tangible or any actual place, not on reality. They're just sort of really theoretical problems. And what EPIC does is it takes away that theoretical, you know, that the make-believe stuff and it replaces it with real-life challenges of problems that really need to be fixed. So by doing that, it immediately it, becomes, it makes the module much more useful because the students are producing stuff that actually is being used in the city or in communities. And not only that, it, it brings the communities and students together and it brings the city government into conversation with the communities. One of our big challenges that we have in the city of Durban is quite often communities don't want to talk to us, you know, because there's this friction around stolen electricity and all that kind of stuff, you know, all the challenges that we have. But this epic model in the Quarry Road informal settlement as part of another project with our UKZN partners has helped completely take away these barriers. We can now go in and cut down trees that have fallen after floods have gone through, whereas before we couldn't get anywhere near the settlement. And, and that's a very, very good example of what EPIC does, is that it brings people together into new partnerships that weren't there before. It's much more practical, it's very cost efficient, and um, everyone's a winner. It literally is a win-win-win situation. 
I'm not saying this has never been done before, but this is a really nice model that works for us in Africa. And we're seeing it growing quite nicely in the network. And I encourage anyone that's interested to join us on the first Monday evening of a month uh, at six o'clock in the evening, South African time, and hear what the, the stories are coming out. It's, it's quite exciting. Thanks, Nzime. Thank you so much, Sean. Talking there about the practical hands-on uh, experience that the EPIC model brings with, with it. And this takes me to my next question, um, which is directed to Edna Odiambo from Nairobi. And uh, Edna, can you tell us how the EPIC project or projects in, in, in your case has improved the practical hands-on experience of university students? I know you work uh, with students at the university. And how students have responded to, to these experiences. But just like uh, Sean did, I'd like you to also take two minutes or so just to tell us and share with us um, a, a brief overview of the epic work that you are doing in Nairobi. Over to you, Edna. All right, thanks so much, Nzime, and thank you everyone for making time to join us for this webinar. So perhaps just a brief introduction about the EPIC Nairobi program. The EPIC Nairobi program was focusing on sustainable mobility. In particular, we were looking at walkability, or what you'd say is you know, supporting pedestrianization because Nairobi has um, almost 50% of the population walking and we still have a long way to go when it goes to um, improving the infrastructure for non-motorized transport. So our pilot was looking at um, basically pedestrianizing a very busy street within the central business district and making it more friendly to pedestrians. And we had drawn from certain disciplines. We had law students working there. We had urban planners, urban designers, and a few students from the architecture department. So basically at the end of the pilot, we were able to see the transformation um, on that small stretch. And there were many other partners involved in the project as well. We had um, some NGOs and we also had some donor partners that were involved in this project. So it was very nice to actually see that, you know, transformation can actually take place when you have the right partnerships and the right tools. So um, perhaps just to answer Mzime's question on how the EPIC projects have improved, you know, the practical hands-on experience of students. I would definitely say that, um, you know, as a teacher, one thing I saw that the EPIC model was able to deliver for the students was they were able to problematize issues better. You could see that it improves their skills to be able to problematize issues because you're exposed to real life challenges. You know, now you're on the street wondering, how do I apply, you know, my legal knowledge? How do I apply my design, my urban design knowledge? to improve um, the street. So you could see that students' ability, you know, to think in a solution-oriented approach had really improved. And um, I mean, I would say generally they're excited um, at the opportunity. I think obviously um, there's a lot of monotony with sitting in the classroom and listening to teachers. So the idea of field work, going out there, and also having an opportunity to interact with city officials was a very exciting opportunity for them. And I think as uh, you know, Sean mentioned, th these are basically very valuable experiences for students. They feel that they have you know, tangible things to quote even in their CVs, um, you know, just right after graduation. They feel that they're making networks within that process of um, undertaking EPIC projects. So definitely I, I saw that they were excited at the opportunity and you know, also the monotony from regular class was, um, was broken by the field work that we undertook that we undertook through the epic project um, i also think it created an opportunity for reflection um, within the students but i mean also as faculty as we teach i think epic gives you that um, sort of you know underlying question in your head how what how what 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 change do you want to bring with the knowledge you have with the skills you have how do you apply yourself i would say that process of you know, reflection was going, was going on for both of us, you know, from the faculty end and from the students. And it definitely pushes you to think more that, you know, this, this, this is what the communities need. And, you know, you want to use education as a means to an end. 
So there's definitely that opportunity for constant reflection on how to continue to improve um, a very practical way towards um, advancing knowledge. Well, thank you so much, uh, Edna, for that and for demonstrating how, how practical and uh, the, the, the skills um, transfer to, to, to students uh, in, in Nairobi. And uh, a follow-up question, uh, Edna, and I think this is something that a lot of people may be asking when it comes to partnership. How important was it in your case um, to work on building trust and relationships and uh, long-term political support. How did you go about this um, in Nairobi? Yeah, I think Zime, that's a very important question. Thank you for that. Um, I, I mean, I would say, you know, essentially everything boils down to people, you know, the connections that you build can definitely guarantee you success or failure. So I would say that it's important to build ties um, across the hierarchy. So for example, in the Nairobi case, we had um, ties with, um, we would say the political brass, and we also had ties with the technical officers. So you find that, of course, it's important to have ties with um, the political brass because they are the ones who have major influence in attracting planning and budgetary support for these projects. And at the same time, of course, they can be able to push for the implementation of um, this kind of projects, particularly also if um, you know, it buys into their agenda and they see that it can help them with re-election and whatnot. And also with the technical officers, in fact, I realized even more important because one, um, of course, they have the knowledge, you know, the nitty gritties on how to go about implementing the plans and the policies in place but also they don't get um, you know, as quickly replaced as the political class. So maybe you are starting an epic project and you've built ties, but next year, this person is coming up for re-election, doesn't get elected. You know, what happens if you didn't build enough ties with the technical officers? So it's very important to ensure that across the hierarchy, you have very close ties. So, um, you know, for example, we have a situation where, you know, political um, groups change and you still want to continue with your epic project, it's the technical officers who will carry through that vision, will even introduce or reintroduce epic to the new political class that has come in. They'll be able to say, you know, this is a good thing. This is something that's um, helping us realize some of our objectives and we should continue with it. So you definitely, um, I, I mean, I would definitely advise um, all of us interested in continuing or doing epic that it's important to ensure you have those close ties um, across board. Okay. Hello. So it looks like Nzime's um, video has, has frozen. So thank you so much for that input, Edna. I'm going to now um, ask uh, Gilbert a question. So I'm going to hand over to Gilbert to please um, reflect on what are some of the challenges and opportunities that have helped your EPIC project in the city of Lusaka. Thank you so much. Thank you to the three, the the speakers that have made uh, their presentations and thanks to uh, Zimi for moderating uh, this far. Thank you so much. Uh, I am based in Osaka, based at the university. And um, after training in 2017, uh, we came back to Osaka running and a few things, uh, projects, uh, ideas came on the table. Largely, we had to begin from the obvious, begin from the familiar, begin with projects that uh, were already sort of uh, uh, being uh, implemented in a different way. So from that 2017 up to today, uh, we have focused largely on how to help the city of Lusaka uh, implement its uh, slum upgrading and the prevention strategy. So our effort has been largely on projects based on specific cities such as Kanyama, Chaisa, uh, and, and many others. 
to help formulate plans that the city can implement to improve living conditions of the people in the city. We've also worked on water security initiative. This was part of the work that was happening last year. And now there are serious talks and the uh, engagements around COVID-19 and community response strategy and leadership at grassroots level. Those are some of the things that we've been working, working on. In terms of the challenges and the opportunities that kick-started our work, firstly, um, the, the urban situation for most, most of the cities and specifically for Osaka is that uh, they are real capacity related uh, issues that require, um, uh, 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 that require addressing. And, and uh, when we came back, we realized, uh, and we've always noted that uh, uh, Lusaka has been going through significant uh, you know, challenges. One of them is a very high incidence of informality, presenting higher vulnerability risks to various factors that include climate change, service delivery, very vulnerable uh, livelihood opportunities, and uh, to some large extent, limitations in inclusive governance dynamics. Uh, those challenges manifest themselves in the political sphere and also in the technical space. And we looked at that as an opportunity for us to quickly invest and move on. So the issue for us was how can we engage with the political space, the mayor, so that we said, look, these are the things that you face. Capacity issues are real, and this is how they manifest. And we can come in as a university to, to work together with the students to support some of the things that you are doing uh, or that you intend to do in order to address some of these uh, bigger problems that you face. At the same time, the city is having those problems and looking for solutions and mobilizing support. The university is also looking at how to transform its ways of, you know, its curricula and also its pedagogy. Universities, particularly for our case, we are constantly and we've been constantly looking for real sites, projects with practical value where we can train our students so that when they finish, they are socially conscious graduates who can provide leadership and who can will be technically sound and they do not need the orientation because they will have learned the concepts, tested the ideas on real life projects that have a real practical meaning for the local authority and for the community, and they can put that on their CVs. This is part of what I consider as my calling in my teaching and, 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 and many others on the projects that we've implemented. That is the, the philosophy and that's the underpinning uh, understand that graduates need to have the you know, conceptual capabilities and being, be transcend to have practical capabilities to negotiate real day-to-day -day, uh, uh, dynamics that are involved in urban management, urban transformation, including building resilience to various shocks, including climate change. So given that the city is engulfed in numerous problems and looking for solutions, but their capacity is significantly limited, and the university is looking for real sites to train graduates, graduates that can produce something tangible for every, for the people in the city, we find the, we found a common ground to work together. And that common ground is what had held us together. The challenge and the challenge turned into an opportunity. In terms of quick starting and getting things underway, we banked on prior contacts between the university and the city government and looked at how we can transform existing partnerships to make them epic how we can ride on existing opportunities, including small projects that were already existing, expand them and frame them in a manner that actually impacts society. And this included looking at what, where is the funding? Where is, what can the invest put on the table? What can the city put on the table? What can third party stakeholders, including donors, like in this case, we had to ride on UN Habitat, putting some money on the table. And how can we frame this engagement in a manner that reflects the interest of all parties, including communities? This is how we framed the opportunity. And this is how we started our work, uh, identifying anchors in the city, in the university, in the community, and looking at third party stakeholders to support this move that seeks to rearrange, transform, and challenge entrenched 
the practices that sort of disempower and you know delay the progress we need in a, in in the city of Lusaka. So this is uh, how I would address my question, and I hand over back to to uh, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gilbert, and thanks to Jessica for taking over there when I had technical glitches. And uh, Gilbert, to 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 go on, um, I know that you've been working a lot with uh, with communities in in Lusaka. Please uh, tell us how or what ways do local governments and communities benefit by having students involved in uh, addressing their city issues? Good, thanks. For the city, um, the first thing, as I said, is increased capacity in the area of producing maps. And we've got great maps that we produce with the students. Uh, that competence is very difficult to get in the cities from technical equipment to technical skills. And that's what the university brings on the table. And that is something the city particularly finds very, very significant. The second one is a financial saving. Uh, to get most of the things that we've been able to do in the cities, it requires consultants to get on the table. And we're not displacing consultants, but we know that cities are challenged financially, particularly where decentralization is weak. So there is a financial gain to that, to, to Epic in the city government. And I'll zero in on one example here. Last year, year 2019, there was a call to help produce plans that would you know, help Lusaka city to transition to a water secure city. Uh, consultants provided bids. The courts were up to, the minimum court was up to $20,000. And the city didn't have that money. Then they looked at the previous the history of the partnership between ourselves and them. They said, why should we look elsewhere? Why can't we call on the University of Zambia to chip in with the students and be able to help us? And the whole cost, for using EPIC model, the whole cost, the whole week was done below $30,000. And the work that was laid by the students stands out up to today. And they keep on referring to us as how we can actually build this and help them. And after that mega saving by the city because of engaging with us, we are more now sought after than when we first reached out to them that want to partner in this way. We are more like required to engage and work with them quite a lot because we demonstrated that financial, financial, financial saving, financial gain the city makes. The work that could have never been done because the city didn't have $20,000, but ended up being done because Epic came in on board, saving in excess of $70,000. That's not a small thing for a country, a city like Lusaka. Then the other thing that communities gain is uh, technocrats sort of struggle to manage complex urban politics. And when universities get into the community, they are seen to be apolitical. They are seen to be young and energetic and wanting to things to change. And they are not, they can't easily get accused of being political. And that is a very significant gain, particularly for technical staff in the city. That we found very useful. And people confiding, people, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, engaging even in the background. Look, there are issues, we can't come out, but the invest can bring some of these things out. Then we also get a co-financing strategy for the, for the project. When we are in Epic, the invest puts in something, the city puts in something, and we all gain in the process. And finally, we are looking at tapping from numerous resources. Today, if I want to go to the city, I do not need to go on the ground to engage, mobilize the, the community. The city has knows that they need to help, and they'll be on the ground. I make a saving. I also ride on their resources. Same. If they need something that the invest can do, we ride on each other, including equipment, including transport. That's real and that's practical, and that's what we've used here before. For communities, the gains are, um, are, are multiple. And some of the first one I'll just dwell on about three. The first is improved project conceptualization by the community, empowering them and making them drive the process in designing, in co creating and co-implementing change on the ground. That could be water security, that could be building resilience to climate change, particular floods, 
that could be improving several things that we've been able to work together. And in our project, one of the things that we've done is to actually get some of these communities participate in mapping activities, improved skills in M and E. So the capacity to conceptualize, understand, has been uh, is 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 real when you take the Epic route. Also, Epic is a is a platform for community voice. Many times they may not speak uh, because they may not have the, the platform. But when we meet in those communities, voices come out, issues on issues that concern the community, and that's not a small gain in areas that are characterized by serious disenfranchisement. Last but not the least is the, um, the urban politics at community level can be disempowering. And when we get in as EPIC model, that disempowering element tends out to be turned into something empowering. You get the counselor and you get to very vulnerable groups of communities, male community members in one room and you create that conversation. Therefore, creating opportunities for improved accountability and some real tangible progress on the ground because people can speak to each other, people can question where the money is that was raised when, and the people can actually document what is resolved as a project at the community level. So we, we see increasing levels of accountability, increasing levels of um, projects actually being done and the community holding the development agenda at that very local level in their own hands while working across the scale from the very local to higher levels of university wars and the ministry units. That's what I would say as, as things that I've seen in, in my project. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gilbert, for those very tangible benefits accrued uh, across the different uh, partners. And um, Sean, um, we've heard a lot about uh, the EPIC model being transformative, especially in how the three uh, collaborative partners uh, work. Why is, uh, is, is, is this fundamental transformation uh, of the relationship between local governments, communities and local universities uh, needed? Because to because of what you gain from doing it. You know, if you don't have this partnership, you have uh, city governments implementing their service delivery uh, mandates to various levels of expertise and effectiveness. Um, uh, there's quite serious challenges in a lot of our cities with uh, our ability to, to implement our mandate. You have universities putting out students and all that's good and you have communities trying to get by in the world. But when you got these three entities that are talking to each other, you end up with a sum of parts that is much bigger than the individual components. So in other words, you can really create powerful outcomes. And Gilbert provided us with some very good examples of that. You know, it's, uh, it's like if you have a box of matches and you have firewood, They'd be nice on their own, but when you put them together, you can keep warm. Uh, so it's a bit like that. Uh, bringing entities together, you get a, a real uh, value add. And I think that's what Epic provides, is it provides this extra value add where there isn't before. And it's uh, for a really efficient uh, system, and it just creates partnerships. And, you know, it's all about partnerships. We, we need these partnerships to solve the problems that currently, individually, we're not solving. Yes, thanks so much uh, for that, uh, Sean. And um, moving on quickly to Edna, what is different about EPIC N, you know, the, the, the EPIC uh, Africa network? Is it not just another network in search of a cause or agenda? Yeah, I mean, Nzime, let me put it this way that um, everything has an agenda. And I do think that um, EPIC has an agenda. And to my mind, the agenda is definitely advancing partnerships towards betterment of communities. And the flexibility of the EPIC model is indicative that you would always um, have it in such a way that it suits your context, your realities, you know, the unique issues that you face. So that way you really have an opportunity to shape it into what you want. I mean, of course, there's the tenants that make the EPIC model, you know, the university partnering with the local government, 
and you know that makes it unique the sustained partnerships um, however it doesn't really dictate that you have to do this this way it's basically seeing how do we come together to you know connect the academic side to the local government side in order to make the places we live in better All right, thank you so much, uh, Itna, for that uh, succinct answer. Uh, so EPIC is not just another or same old um, agenda. And uh, Gilbert, maybe um, share with us some of the challenges or barriers that you um, people can face in trying to improve collaboration between local governments communities and uh, local universities and how these can be overcome. Right. Thank you, Zime, for the question. Uh, I'll take it just now. The uh, number of challenges, while the opportunities are real and while progress is made and seen, there is need for real effort to make that change happen. There's need to invest in building the partnerships and some of the challenges that we've faced, um, particularly for Lusak, and I think that applies to other cities, is um, there's high level of bureaucracy. Uh, things can take long to materialize. What is needed is persistence and the conviction that this, which we're trying to push as a university, or as champions in the city, in the community, and in the university, is something we believe in and we are committed to it. And sometimes there'll be opportunities that need to be seized to make things happen in sometimes unexpected way. So that is um, the, 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 the issue is the bureaucracy, how to get access to the mayor, how to make things really, you know, to reach decision makers in the city that actually make the decision that yes, let's partner in this way. The second one is um, uh, cities are poorly funded in a number of instances, including Lusaka. And so linking what we are doing in the communities and the city to budget so that some of the proposals that are put on the table actually see the day of light in transforming people's life in real terms. That can be can take long. And the solution to that, in our view, is to be humble, to do with that which is feasible, and to look elsewhere when projects are being formulated. Who else is doing something in the city so that what the city and the university are putting together in the community the money is flying around seeking to improve one or two things. Could be water, could be environment, uh, gains. Those resources tend to locate where you know uh, ideas have already been provided. And in our case, that has been used before by riding on uh, the Germans who wanted to improve water security. And they found our uh, network working and they pounced on it. Day by day, they found our network working. They pounced on it and said, yes, this is what we need to pick and work with. Being humble and looking out for where else, who else is doing what in the city. Then uh, it is it is uh, essential also to understand the aspirations and frustrations of students. Uh, they are there to learn, and practical work, working in the realm of theory and practice in the middle can be very challenging. And it's important to be empathetic and to understand what practical challenges we're going through. And how can we intervene as, 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 as managers, as academics, to ease the experience so that they don't get so strained and frustrated, but they enjoy the process. Uh, that requires people who are present, epic managers who are present, epic officials who are present, partly in the life of the students, uh, and appreciating uh, the background and, and the history of some of the students. Uh, and also the skills level, what is it that they can do and that is that they can do. So those are some of the challenges that, um, that uh, need to be addressed and seized and turned into uh, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gilbert. Uh, on that reflection around um, the transformation that, or transformative relationships between the three partners or um, under the EPIC uh, model. At this point, I'm going to give uh, a few reflections um, based on the presentations we've had so far, and then we'll open the floor to, to questions of which some have already started uh, coming through uh, or, or, or on the chat there. 
And if anyone wants to pose questions, please feel free to, to do so. But um, going back, we heard from our panelists, uh, starting off with uh, Tony, who gave, gave us an overview of the EPIC model, as well as how uh, the network started and has been growing. And uh, what, what I gleaned there is the fact that the EPIC model is, is collaborative. And we also heard from the cities about how they shaped some of their collaborative partnerships. But I think what's important also to point out is the fact that the EPIC model is, uh, has this element of inclusivity uh, in, in ensuring that you know, those partners, the universities, the local governments, as well as communities, are, are, are part of the program and essentially also including students from the universities. Uh, I think another point that was important in talking about uh, the EPIC model is how it gives this hands-on experience, um, particularly for students, and given, uh, as Sean uh, explained, the, the more theoretical uh, approach that most universities in tertiary education take versus this hands-on experience, which gives uh, students the ability, as Edna pointed out, to to improve their skills to problematize uh, things much, much better as, as, as they face them and, and also become part of the uh, solution. I think another important point that all the panelists have brought out is the fact that the, the EPIC model brings people together. Um, so it's not only collaborative, but it, it, it makes people come together uh, and, and to work uh, together. And uh, something that Edna uh, pointed out was this, um, uh, in, in the case of Nairobi, how they were able to um, work with multiple disciplines, um, not only uh, a, a siloed or, or, or single discipline uh, approach in trying to solve the walkability issue uh, in, in, in Nairobi. And another point that was important um, and, and that came up in, in some of the questions I posed is this transformative uh, nature. And we, we, we heard of testimonies both, um, not only both, but in, in, in Durban uh, around their river management uh, project. And I liked the example that Sean gave there to say that they as a city or, or, or municipality we're, we're, we're not in touch or we're, we're not able to go into communities, but since they implemented the EPIC model, they, they have this leeway and they, uh, that gap has been uh, uh, bridged. And I think also what was important, which Edna elaborated on, is this importance of sustainability, given that the very short uh, uh, turnover, uh, especially politically, uh, and why it's important to build these political ties. And that's, you know, the, the, the work that one would have started or implemented uh, becomes sustainable. And this involves also working with the technical uh, uh, level when it comes to, 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 to the cities. And um, Gilbert elaborated on um, the advantages of the EPIC model uh, broken down into the different partners. As I've already pointed out for the university, it's the skills transfer, it's the confidence being built in the students, uh, it's in them being uh, practical um, and, and being able to be part of the solution when it comes to local uh, problems and also uh, enhancing uh, innovation in them. Um, and also bridging that gap to, to, to have students who are hands-on, who, who can uh, solve problems without being too theoretical. And also for the city, and Gilbert gave a very good example from Lusaka, is this increased, the increased cap, uh, capacity, how, for example, the Lusaka uh, local council was able to save a lot of money instead of engaging consultancies uh, or, or they, they, they were able to work through the EPIC uh, program and really uh, um, use much less than they would have uh, spent on, which is important because it ties into the issue that Gilbert also highlighted that 
sometimes funding or budgets is a problem. But working with the, with the sustain, sustainability model in EPIC, it, it's possible to then address uh, that, that issue. And then of course, under the advantages um, of the EPIC model for communities, uh, it was pointed out that there's this improved conceptualization of uh, problems and issues. Again, the EPIC model is able to bring uh, to times are uh, underrepresented in, in the city and in, in, in such processes. Um, and also, I think just to conclude uh, before we open the floor, um, we were able to hear that the EPIC uh, agenda or a format or a framework that it works on. But what's important to note is how flexible uh, it is, and we heard from the cities how different their projects uh, were, how the approaches were different. Sean, for example, is the epic uh, 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 the champion. He sits in the city. Edna and uh, Gilbert are in the university, and so forth uh, and so on. And lastly, some of the issues I had already talked about uh, funding. Uh, we heard that there's bureaucracy, but remember, Edna gave us a a very good way of, of sustaining relationships and, and building trust just to make sure that we circumvent uh, the bureaucracy and have sustained uh, uh, programs. But that this takes time as, uh, as in any, any relationship and processes, it takes time to build trust and to build uh, those re uh, relationships. So those are, um, uh, uh, some of the reflections that I have noted. And at this point, we want to, um, to, to, to open the floor. And I have three questions to start off with. And the good thing is they are all very specific. So we'll start off with a question that was, uh, that is directed to Edna. And this question comes from uh, Raisa Levy. And Edna, uh, Raisa wants to know what obstacles you faced in Nairobi uh, which could hinder possibility to carry on EPIC goals in the community. So I will ask you to respond and then we'll come back to the other question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mzime, and thanks, Raisa, for your question on what obstacles that perhaps, you know, one could face in Nairobi that could hamper the EPIC program. Um, I think, well, if you are aware about the dynamics in Nairobi, there's been quite a bit of, should you say, <laughs> ups and downs when it comes to the city leadership. Sorry, I've just been told here to show my face. Give me a minute. So there's definitely been quite a bit of um, ups and downs because we had um, Nairobi County functions, key functions such as transport planning, environment, being handed over to the newly established Nairobi Metropolitan Services, now under office of the president. So of course the dynamics are different. Um, you're navigating a different space now, and we are not necessarily working with local government, but we are working with a body under national government carrying out important local government functions. So that in itself is, well, I would say that on one hand, it could be an obstacle, but also on, on, on another hand, it could be a blessing because then maybe you're navigating less bureaucracies and perhaps there'll be more political goodwill and support for the projects you want. Um, one of the challenges we faced that, um, perhaps is not unique to Nairobi is the fact that, you know, the political heads I talked about, they could be reshuffled or changed, gosh, even within the month. So today you're speaking to so-and-so who is in charge of planning, tomorrow you're told, no, 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 that guy has been transferred to transport. That one has, because, you know, those are political appointees, they, they, they get changed pretty quickly. Um, so I would say that sometimes can be a real challenge because then you feel that you have to keep on reintroducing, so to speak, you know, the model to those um, political class that you're dealing with. But as um, Zime mentioned, you can try and mitigate it by establishing a good relationship with technical officers. Um, another thing that perhaps, you know, is um, a challenge um, could be, you know, the, the, the kind of funding and budgetary support that universities get. It sometimes can make it a bit difficult also to carry out so much field work or practical work but there's definitely ways to navigate it. And I, I wouldn't really give um, a prescribed answer because that's dependent on 
you know, even your faculty, not only your institution, but even faculty dynamics vary. So I'm sure there's always a way to sort of find out how you can still be able to um, offer these students a practical experience um, towards learning. So those are the ones I can think about at the moment. But um, so far, I would say I haven't come across any challenge that one cannot fight or mitigate. I think there's always a way of working around it. Thanks so much um, for, for, for that response, uh, Edna, and for, for, for encouragement as well. And the next question, uh, I'll direct to Sean. And um, I'm not sure who it's from, but uh, Sean, the question here is, what is the response of local government to the model? And what enthusiasm do universities demonstrate in joining the network? Thanks. So that's a two-part question. Uh, thanks, yeah, and that question was from Raisa as well. Um, so it would vary uh, depending on where you are in the, in the world or on the African continent. Different uh, uh, organizations would respond differently and different within an organization would respond differently. So I'll give you an example, my example, what happened in Durban. I can tell you a little bit about what's happened in America over the last 10 years, and then I'll summarize it up. Uh, so when after the bond training at, at the ICLE Resilience Congress in 2017, uh, I was all inspired and I went back uh, to Durban uh, and particularly within our Durban Research Action Partnership, I went to my academic partners that I was working with and I said, there's, there's this great model. We are planning a, a training down in Cape Town in December. Are you interested? And they all go, mm, sounds good, but we're too busy. <laughs> And it was hard work. Uh, at first, I had like five or six people said, yes, that sounds like good, but we, we cannot do it now because obviously people are busy and you're asking them to, to think about something that's a little bit different to what they've been doing normally. But we had one uh, academic who's a good partner in our program, our partnership, and she said, well, we have this uh, module that I could adapt and we could try, uh, let's, let's try it out. And so that was, that's what started our pilot. And we did the pilot over the 2018, 19 academic years. Uh, and that worked. Uh, and since that pilot, now in, in planning our scaled up uh, mod, uh, partnership for next year, 2021, we already have eight different blind functions that have committed with their corresponding uh, disciplines, committed to doing a program on transformative river management. So we can see having got a foot in the door the, the, the follow-up has been very, very positive, and we're having a, a, we're having a, 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 got a really nice program being built right now. And the first module is actually being run in the second semester of this academic year now that we're in now. Um, and that's all new. So this is, that's been our experience. How you, when, you are, when, you, when you go and knock on doors, and it's as simple as going and knocking on doors. You don't need millions of rands or dollars or whatever to start. You just need to go knock on doors and say, listen, this is this idea. You need to be as convincing as a preacher, perhaps, uh, if you, you want to do it quickly. But uh, you, you really only need those who can see the value of it and are willing to give it a try in the beginning to get something started. And it grows from there. It's like a snowball. We don't have many snowballs in Africa. You still have a few up on your mountain in Tanzania, but uh, most of us are the snow is short. Um, but <clears throat> it gets going quickly. In America, this has been going for 10 years, and what they're finding is that there is ever-growing demand. Cities go through a partnership, and having gone through a one-year sort of cycle of it, there's inevitably very much more interest, and it grows from there. And, and that's what the, my biggest sort of... A piece of advice is if you've got a champion, you need someone who believes in the model, who's interested to get it going. Go and knock on doors. And uh, even if you get 10 people saying no, you might, the first people might, person might say yes, or the 10th person might say yes. But it's when you get that agreement to start that, that you can make progress. Generally, the model starts with an academic uh, uh, because obviously it is something that's run typically by university. So Durban was a bit weird we had the city person starting it going to the academics but uh, generally it's an academic so it's usually a little bit more challenging going to a city because the cities have much less to do with research traditionally than sort of ac academia obviously um, so getting them in, uh, interested uh, you, it takes a, a bit of sort of convincing 
Uh, not a huge amount because, you know, you're offering City something that's very useful. And the nice thing about Epic is intuitively it, it makes sense. You, you can listen to the story and once you understand, you can go, okay, that, that sounds like a good idea. Now, how do we do it? Uh, and, uh, and so that's what's been our case as well. Um, you know, as uh, more city officials have heard about our pilot success, they've, they've come on board. For universities, it's a much easier sell. Uh, universities are, um, by their nature, more sort of uh, liberal and more open to change uh, than a, a city government might be. Uh, and uh, so it becomes easier for them to take it on. But remember, you're still um, asking somebody to do something different to what they normally do. But the good thing about uh, Epic, if you're talking to a module coordinator, you can say, you've got a, a third year project that you need students to do or an honors project or master's student project. We can do all the running around for you. We can take the students out to site and they can work on it and we can set you, we can give you a good topic to do. And you take a lot of work away from the module coordinator and that's what the Epic coordinator does. And so it becomes a, a win for the module coordinator in the same way it becomes a win for the city because they're getting the knowledge and a win for the students. The only people who don't win are the, the EPIC coordinator from the city and the EPIC coordinator from this, the, the university. And in that first year of partnership, they have to build all these relationships. So that first year is hard work for those two people particularly because you, you, you're starting something new. But as it goes from there, it just settles down and it becomes, I wouldn't say self-running uh, self because it does need a bit of effort, but it, it really becomes a lot easier to do it as the relationships are built. And when you've got those relationships intact, it's much more um, resilient to changes in city leadership and all that kind of stuff because you have a body of evidence showing the value of it and you have a lot of people invested in it and you have a lot of partners uh, in, in it. And that, that's what makes it work. Hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for that clear explanation as well as how value can be demonstrated to win over the city and the university. I have two more questions uh, that are direct to Gilbert and Sean, and then I will hand over to, to Jess. So Gilbert, again, a question from uh, Raisa for you, and um, should like to know, is there any evidence of change for improved civic action? Gilbert, Thank you. do you want yes. to take that Thank one? You. Thank you for the for the question. Uh, yes, uh, there is, um, and I say so on a number of fronts. The first one. Oh, sorry. The first one is um, we've never we've not seen uh, a situation here in Osaka where the community. Uh, is basically getting the center stage in driving programs and the projects. For example, the COVID-19 response, the work that is just starting around now and working around it, uh, the, the, the community is, is, is sort of in front and, and, and demanding that they drive the process. Uh, they are not just asking, uh, asking their civic leaders, they're asking all of us, including the funder and saying, look, what is our role? Uh, you know, increasing that sense of presence, sense of ownership, and ability to speak out, to communicate. Uh, and when we report on COVID reconstruction, how, this, how the communities at the center questioning us and driving the process, you'll be able to see the real transformation happening in that space. Uh, that is one. In the past, it, is, it will be the counselor and the technocrats uh, doing their work. That's not the case in a number of projects right now. And you'll see that particularly in the current project, in the current projects. And um, why this particular year is significantly visible in terms of civic transformation and governing is we've worked with the similar structures in the community, the ward development committees, the zonal development committees, those community structures for some time now and the capacity is present is built. Uh, if these get out, similar to what uh, um, Edna was talking about, that might mean another process of building capacity, which in so is disruptive, but in itself is good because now we expand uh, civic skills, leadership skills in the community. 
by having many people out there able to engage in that civic arena, civic space. So that's um, uh, that's what I, I I can provide as as uh, the response. And also, it's an issue of attitude. Uh, if people in the council begin to see these communities as real stakeholders, not to be provided services only, but to be included and be part of the process of designing and co-creating the services, uh, then civic space expands, uh, something that the EPIC actually provides. Mm. And this has been observed in our city. Thank you so much, Gilbert, for that example of improved civic uh, action and engagement from Lusaka, which answers uh, that question. And um, the last question I'd like to direct uh, to Tony. And um, Tony, there's a question here that's asking about whether there's a role for business uh, in the EPIC model. And this was asked by Lisa Higginson. Uh, I'll repeat that, Tony. The question is, is there a role for business in the EPIC model? Um, yes, there is. I mean, it's, uh, there's nothing in the model that precludes private interest from becoming a partner with the community and with the, um, with the university and the local government. And if I can share just one example very quickly, uh, there was a project that took place in uh, a small town uh, called Willow Creek, Oregon. And the narrative of this is written up on the Epic N website. But the um, university and the community, the local government wanted to find ways to uh, redevelop the business aspects of their community. And one of the things they targeted was this waste facility that was taking local waste and dealing with it. Well, a private interest got involved and through the ideas that were transmitted by the students on how to transform this into a bigger business, a, a more sustaining, self-sustaining business, a cleaner kind of business, um, the developer or the, the private interest presented that, submitted that as a grant proposal and was awarded the proposal to basically implement one of the ideas the student had come up with. So they transformed this local waste facility into a regional facility where waste was transported in to that facility and they used it to create energy, uh, uh, handled the waste in a very ecologically sustainable manner and it became a business that brought almost a million dollars a year into the city. Now, I'm not saying every example turns out like that, but private interests were very much involved in this and happy to be involved, I should say. Thank you so much, Tony, for that, um, for that example from the US, which answers our last question. At this point, my role as facilitator is done, and I would like to thank our panelists for sharing with us the experiences on the EPIC model and the work that they, they've all been doing, and also on the EPIC Africa network. And I will hand over to Jess, who is going to do the closing remarks, but also tell us a little bit more about some of the upcoming events that ITLI has. Thank you. Thanks, Mimi. And yeah, thank you so very, very much for moderating and to all speakers, you were fantastic. And thanks to all participants for, for joining and being part of this great discussion. Um, at the moment, you're seeing a flash of um, a few slides from, from the EPIC network. But um, yeah, in closing, I just want to remind that this, this nature of this webinar was around models of working together, of growing that local capacity and deepening that research through partnerships. And what better way to continue to build these partnerships and to be inspired than through ICLE Africa's Locks for Africa virtual conference. It's the first of its kind on the continent. It's using virtual platforms to bring together leaders and innovators to exchange new ideas 
and strategies for climate change across the continent. And this year, more specifically, to find those solutions for unlocking climate finance in Africa. So an incredible, important topic at the moment. This online conference is taking place between the 3rd and the 11th of November. And you can see the registration link currently on the slide on the page. So please do go to this link um, and you can see the full program and much, much, much more information about this really exciting Congress. You really don't want to miss this learning, networking and action orientated opportunity. So once again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the panelists, the participants and of course, Simsimi for moderating. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we hope to see you at LOX just around the corner. Thank you.